All right then, welcome to the very first of my live stream lecture series. I, I don't know why I said the first. The, the first of my color changes in my live stream lecture series. Uh, I hope that this setup works. But yeah, besides that, welcome, welcome to this. So the very first uh, color change that I'll go over is called the Tebe Change One, or Tebe One, or Tebe Color Change, or the Bertram Change, as it's usually know now uh, known nowadays. So um yeah, uh but essentially what the Tebe Change One or the Tebe uh, or like the Bertram Change is. It's that it's essentially a free-handed color change. So if you don't know what free-handed color change is, it's basically a color change that happens away from the deck, right? So uh, yeah, so the the color change happens off of the deck, right? In most instances, in instances, in most cases of the um, of the uh, of color changes, right? For example, the uh, the earth is change. It has to happen on top of the deck, right? You have to do the change. Uh, sorry, you have to do the change on top of the deck or whatever, right? I don't really know how, <laughs> but right. Even for example, the pu uh, pugs pass or the uh, the cardini change, you have to do it on top of the deck, right? Or the um, or just the classic color change, right? Where you have to add a card in, right? That's also on top of the deck right which is kind of um interesting so the bertram change is one of the uh one of the few classic color changes that can occur off of the deck which is sort of interesting so uh yeah anyways i do kind of like this change uh it's um it's kind of sad to see some people underestimate it or just dismiss it because you know it's one of the first color changes that they've learned in like on like youtube or whatever right so naturally because it's the first thing that you learn it's going to be the um the most basic or the most beginner level right but it can look amazing and does you know it does look great right so personally i think like people dismiss it a bit too early on but there's a reason why it survived for like 40 years right and you know uh, some people, uh, some like high level slime hand people still do it because it's an actual good change. So yeah, if you're just, if, if you're a beginner and you were an intermediate magician and you're just like, oh yeah, the Bertram change. Yeah. Um, yeah. I learned that like when I first started, don't just dismiss the move because there are, there are some merits to the move. And so I'll go over the, um, the move. So as per usual, I'll go over some uh, just a bit of history with the uh, revolving around the Tebe Change or the Tebe Change One. So Tebe Change One was actually first published in Bertram uh, Bertram on Sleight of Hand back in 1983. So it's it, it's been exactly 40 years. So it's been um, yeah the 40th anniversary of this move, I suppose. And yeah, it, it was published under the name of Tebe Color Change, right? So there's actually a Tebe color change uh, or Tebe change two, which uh, looks a bit like this. I'm not sure if I can do it with uh, with this deck, but uh, I'll try as best as I can. So man, I really have to remember how I did this. Uh, so it's this uh, steel here, and then right, and then gives a bit of time, and then that's it. So it's it's a non-visual change, but um, but that's where it, it differs from like the Bertram change because the Bertram change or Tibet change one is a vir uh, is a uh, visual change, which is um, which is a pretty big contrast. But interestingly enough, there are more color changes in this book, but basically only this change uh, sort of caught on, I guess, right? Because um, if you notice, this move is known as the Bertram change rather than the Tibet change one. So it, it is interesting to see that this move is the move that became the uh, the poster boy, the signature move of Bertram, even though it's like not really uh, what Bertram is known for, because Bertram in general is known for quite a bit of stuff. And it's, it's sort of interesting to see that it's only this color change that became uh, became Bertram's uh, poster boy, I guess. Uh, man, I don't know what I'm doing with my hands. <laughs> but um, yeah, just as a little fun fact regarding Tebe Change 1 or Tebe Changes in general uh, that uh, I don't really see a lot of people mentioning is that the name Tebe is actually a combination of two words or two names rather. So it's a combination of Tenkai 
and Bertram. So if you probably uh, if you if you read the book, you'll notice that Tebbit Change One and Tebbit Change Two are they're part of the uh, they're, it's part of the section, not necessarily on color changes, but it's part of the section that's under Tenkai, and the Tenkai section is all of Bertram's ideas regarding the Tenkai palm. So if you don't know the Tenka palm, it's basically a palm that looks like this. And this was developed by a uh, Japanese magician, Tenkai Ishida. So that's uh, that's where it came from. And so, yeah, Tebe Change is basically Tenkai Bertram together. And so it's T-E, and so it's like Ten, and then Be is Bertram, right? So that's where it came from, which is, um, yeah, I just it's sad to see people not mention that because I think that's... Um, it's a pretty pretty noteworthy part of um, of the move's name, even though because it, it's the entire like section for for the move, so you know might as well. So as I mentioned before, um, the Tenkai Palm was created by Tenkai Ishida, a Japanese magician, and it was actually first published in a book by John Northern Hilliard back um, back in 1938. So that was in Greater Magic. So, um, so just be, uh, yeah. So just before I get into the Bertram change, I just want to go over the Tenkai Palm. I already made a video on the Tenkai Palm, but you know, I I wanna I wanna go over it because this is probably going to receive a bit more attention than the um, than the um, than the Tenkai Palm video itself. So I'll go over the Tenkai Palm over here as well. So the Tenkai Palm is supposed to look like this, right? If I ever see you do this or anything of this sort, so I, I call these like jazz hands. So if you're familiar with uh, Monsters Inc., uh, Sully does like jazz hands or, or or whatever, right? He does like some weird hands. So that's called jazz hands, or uh, some people like to call it T-Rex hands. It really doesn't matter. But if I see you do this with a tankai palm, I'm going to throw hands. <laughs> so. The um, the palm card is actually supposed to be over here, so the palm card is supposed to be in line with uh, where your ring finger and your pinky finger, right? So it's supposed to be in the space in between over here, right? So that's where the the right long edge of the card is supposed to be. So it's over here. The very next thing is that your thumb then wraps over the card like so, and then the pad of your thumb over here contacts the um, the left long edge over here, right? So it contacts it basically sort of um, sor sort of near the top left uh, corner over here, but just a bit lower. So I'd say it's about like near the indices sort of deal, right? So it's over here. So you want to sort of expose the top left corner, so, right? So it's sort of over here. The very next thing that you're gonna do is then, now uh, you're just going to curl in your fingers, right? So rather than having jazz hands, you're just going to curl in all your fingers. And these fingers don't have to necessarily contact the card. Mine are just kind of floating uh, sort of below it. But you can contact the card if you want to, but you know, it doesn't really matter. So these fingers don't really do anything. It's more the index that has the sort of biggest role. So over here, your index actually contacts the corner. So it contacts the top left corner. And then by extension, the thumb as well. So it just goes over there and that's that, right? And uh, make sure that your, your fingers are kind of closed because if they're, if they're like this, uh, it's no better than the jazz hands. So make sure that they're all gently curled in, right? And your index is contacting your thumb. And so, yeah, that's, uh, that's basically it. But mainly it's contacting the top left corner. And so this is, uh, this is how the Tenkai Palm is actually supposed to look like. Again, no, no jazz hands. So the the great thing about this is that now, now that you have this, the angles from the front are great, right? If you had this, this is for sure going to flash from the front, right? There's no doubt about it. But if you just gently curled in your fingers, now you can even expose your thumb as being sort of free, right? So now you're good from this angle, you're also good from this angle. Obviously not from the uh, from the left side and not from the back, but you know, it's way better than this because now you're you're flashing this as well over here. So, you know, just, just gently curling your fingers and you're good from like a very good amount of space. So you're good from here 
to basically here right that's that's how good the angles are so um yeah if you only did the t-rex arms it would just look very very weird right because on social media i still see people doing like oh vanish and then move right it's 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 yeah i i'm i'm mad every time i see that i'm like why so one pet peeve is that you know if you think that more open thinks that uh, equals more magical and more natural uh you're kind of uh you're kind of damn wrong <laughs> right so basically what the tenkai palm is actually meant to emulate is this relaxed position right so you know how when you're you're not holding anything your hands just kind of do this so the tenkai palm is sort of meant to um is sort of meant to reflect on that and uh, the other thing that it can sort of um is sort of meant to look like is this right so now your hand just looks like it's it's on the table right so it, it's supposed to imitate that so by um by design the tank of palm is meant to look very very you know relaxed and it's just not supposed to be anything right sort of just like a classic palm right or a broken palm or just whatever right so palms are not supposed to be burned right they're not supposed to look like you're not palming anything the general purpose or the only purpose of palms is just to steal something right and to steal something that is unnoticed right and the best way to go unnoticed is just to not look like you're doing something right so if you do this it definitely looks like you're trying to do something because you're t-rexing right so if you just do this i'll, I'll do it without the card right if you're doing this right versus this you can definitely see that there's a huge uh difference right of i'm doing something too you know i'm just relaxing my hands right so make sure that your tenkai palm is again it's very gentle it's very relaxed and just you know carry on right so that's it for the tenkai palm so before i go into the um the color change itself i'm actually just going to go into the steel so uh what i mean by steel isn't necessarily like stealing the card from the deck what i meant is uh stealing the um uh, the double from oh, no that's not a good color contrast stealing the uh the card that you want to change into right so for example this is my uh this is my uh, indifferent card and this is the card that i want to change into so that's on the bottom right so i'm going to present the uh the handling that ross bertram actually used before uh before um yeah before the modern variation i suppose so you have your double. I'm not going to teach how to get into the double. You can just go, uh, yeah, I mean, I already taught like the soft double or whatever. So you can just do like a soft double to a uh, Stuart Gordon double lift or whatever. And so you're in this position, right? So now, uh, basically, uh, one thing that I should probably mention is that Ross Bertram actually did, um, did quite a few trade shows when he performed so it made sense why he was like always standing around trying to look uh sort of free and whatnot right so in context this is for for trade shows so yeah so if, if some motions actually look outdated or anything it's because it is right it's for trade shows and not for close-up magic or not for social media so yeah but i'm still gonna present them because i think that they are important for for the context and important for you know it's important to to know why uh, certain certain things were were made and why certain changes were made too so if I was Ross Bertram and I wanted to show this card as being just one, I would just grab, uh, so first off, I would pinch this card with my index and my thumb, right, near the index corner over here at the bottom right corner, right? So this is where I would grab the card, right? And I would just be able to show it around, right? So the very next thing you're going to do is that you're going to bend your wrist so then this card it's sort of on its long edges so it's rather it goes from a portrait position to a landscape position so you're going to bend your right wrist over here the very next thing you're going to do is that now your left hand is going to go around of this card right it's going to go around of this card where your pinky ring middle and index finger are going to wrap around the long edge of the deck right personally i like the card lined on the um sort of on the first knuckle of my of my index finger over here 
And then the very next thing that you're going to do is that now your thumb actually contacts the rightmost uh, edge of the card over here. And then I'm just going to let go. All right, so now I'm in this, this sort of weird position, which now allows me to just use my thumb to push this card onto the other side. You don't have to worry about the double splitting because, because uh, also this, uh, this like the long edges are being pinned by my index and the base of my thumb over here. I kind of forgot to mention that. I don't know why, but basically because I have these two points guiding this card, there's basically no way for this, uh, for this double to split, right? So now I have my thumb on the, uh, on the right edge of the deck, which allows me to push on it. And this card passes through, right? And I continue pushing until this index is exposed right so uh i'm over here i grab over here and i push right but as i push through i sort of want to bend my left wrist sort of uh clockwise until it's back in that uh portrait position so if you notice uh ross bertram has a uh, qu quite a few position changes so he always goes from uh portrait to like landscape back to portrait right so here you're over here and then you're done pushing this card through which exposes this uh upper left corner now your right hand is going to come over and again it's just going to your index and your thumb are going to clip this card by its index corner over here right and now what you'll notice is this card is basically in the perfect position to be Tenkai Palmed, right? So I'm over here, and this card is basically already in Tenkai Palm. You actually modify this to Tenkai Palm both cards, right? So now, now that, uh, right, so again, th this, is, this is the Tenkai Palm, right? And now that I'm here, I can Tenkai Palm both cards, right? So now, I can just leave my left hand and leave these two cards in my right hand like so and now to to do the steal this is probably the easiest part since you're already in tenkai palm your left hand is going to reach over and contact just just about anywhere for this top card and this allows me to just you know just pivot this card out by just pushing this card with my thumb right and you'll see that uses my index finger as a pivot point so this card just pivots out right and that's uh that's basically the steal right there's not much else to it because when you go through this process you're basically already in a tenkai palm right you're basically already a tenkai palm which which means that now you can go directly into the change right so that's the original design of the steal for the um for the table change one all right So, um, yeah, this, uh, this is heavily outdated. <laughs> so if you noticed, uh, not many people actually do this anymore, right? Not many people do this anymore. Uh, whoops, I don't know how I'm screwing that up, but not many people do this tunneling motion anymore, right? So what you can do instead is that, you know, you have this card in a normal, uh, dealer script like so. What you can do now is that you can actually just grab this card by just it's uh it's uh top left corner over here in the same position as your as your uh as the uh tunneling motion uh, of R ross bertram and you just do the exact same thing right so rather than doing this entire transfer tunnel here this you just go straight into it so you have the cards in the left hand dealer's grip and you just grab it and then you just go into a, uh, yeah, just go into it, right? So you do the exact same steel motion, right? Because you're already in the Tenkai Palm here, right? You're already in Tenkai Palm and you smear this card over and you're good, right? So
So you can just do that if you're not uh, into trade show magic, which I'm not even sure is actually still a thing. But you know, it's um, yeah, it's sort of interesting to see how some magic actually sort of evolved through its uses, right? So if you're doing so obviously this is a lot better for close-up right because now you're just showing hey look it's just uh I have one card right and i just already stole the card right so this is a lot better for close-up but if you're doing a trade show or whatever you're trying to show your hands right you're like yeah look this card passes through a tunnel and then here watch when it passes through the tunnel again it changes Right. So depending on on the situation, you sort of want, you know, different uh, different approaches to magic. Right. It, it's not necessarily that this is I mean, I guess this is sort of, it's not necessarily that this is outdated, but it's um, it's out of the, uh, the current niche of magic, I suppose. So. Um, so, yeah, if, if you want to do the tunnel motion, I think I think it has its own merits. I think that if you're if you're doing parlor or you're doing like a stage, I think this can actually look really, really, really sort of nice, right? Because you're doing, because it's like smooth, right? And then doing that and then doing whatever, right? So yeah, I think that this uh, deal variation, the steel, oops, sorry, of the steel has its own merits, but you know, at the same time, you know, this doesn't look too bad. So now I'll actually go over the original change, right? So this is the mechanics for the original change. So I went over the steel uh, as well as more of a modern variation or handling of the steel. So now I can go over the, um, the change itself. Uh, sorry, let me find like, oh, okay. These two cards will work. So I have my two cards, I have my double over here and I just stole it out. So now, now I have my uh, my two cards. Uh, so now I have my single card displayed. So remember, I have my my card over here and I smeared it, right? So I know some people who like to grab this card by the blank index just to show this corner as well. But personally, I just like grabbing it by the um, by the uh, by the index as well. And Ross Bertram actually grabs it by this index as well. So over here, you'll notice that um, I'm actually pinching the card a bit differently than before. So it's my middle finger and my thumb that's actually pinching the index corner now, right? Because I want my index finger to be contacting the short edge of the deck, right? The left short edge of the deck, of the card rather. And this is going to be important later on for the mechanics. But basically, you have your card in Tenkai Palm stolen away. And what you're going to do is that now you're actually just going to contact this card with your index, middle, ring, and pinky finger on the front edge of the deck and your thumb on the back edge of the deck, right? And sort of arced over like so, right? So if if you're familiar with uh, with modern tank, uh, with modern Ber Bertram changes, they're actually just sort of off to off to the right. The original handling for the Bertram change was actually arced over like so, right? So I believe that he actually did this to to just sort of do a trade show, right? So he would he would sort of show his back to to the to the audience and be like, watch, Oop, right? So he could do that, right? So you have your your hand arced over like so, and now what you're going to do is that you're just going to you'll notice that these these fingers sort of uh, act as a guideway or, or a guide rail rather. So now you're just going to go over it once. You're going to go over this this card once. And as you go over, you're going to match this top left corner with the bottom left corner, right? So you're going to match index to index over here. So you're just going to pin it against over here, right? So you're just going to slip it underneath of your thumb and try to match it as best as possible right while your hand is still arced over it so so you're in this position and now uh so so you'll notice that to to sort of do this i do sort of need to sort of need to clear my thumb a bit so now it's no longer contacting the uh the bottom card but that's fine 
Honestly, it never really needs to contact the bottom card. It just needs to contact the top card. So over here, it's sort of here, right? You can just do this and could just sort of let it flow over here, right? So yeah, you're over, you're now in this position and you're still arced over it. Now, what you can do is that you can actually just uh, execute the change. And the way that you execute this change is that you actually just uh, move your hand to the right. Uh, yeah, there's basically no other thing, right? So you know, you'll know you notice that when you move your hand to the right over here, your thumb is contacting the long edge of this card, which means that now you can use this thumb that's pinching both corners of the cards as a pivot point, right? So now your thumb moves and you're using your thumb as a pivot point and you'll notice that this card will naturally swivel around as my right hand goes, right? So I'm over here and over here. Okay, so one, uh, one thing that I forgot to mention is that one interesting thing about this arc position is that this actually has some pretty good <laughs> angles, right? Surprisingly. Uh, so if you notice from this here, you actually don't see the palm card, right? It's over here. But, you know, it's it's surprisingly good with angles and you can actually show this corner as well. So if you're over here, I can actually show this right corner over here as being not changed and I can just change it, right? So this actually has some good angles for people to say like, oh man, Ro Ross Bertram didn't know what he's doing. No, he probably performed more shows than any of us combined. So, you know, I would argue that he knows what he's doing, right? So now you're over here and you're using your index uh so you're using your middle and your uh your thumb to uh to pin these two cards together after you're done matching up the two corners so one one good way to match up the two corners is that you see these two round edges over here on both cards you just really need to line those two those two up right so now that you're over here you're just going to rub you're just going to move your your finger your right hand to the right and this card will naturally be kicked up by your thumb right and so you'll notice that as i move this right hand to the right this card will swivel at the same rhythm right so so you don't have to worry about flashing it's because by the time that your right hand clears this card the change will already have been done, right? Uh, because yeah, that's that's built into the mechanics, right? So now that you're here, uh, I'm, I'm just going to go back over here. So the way that, so if you're having trouble lining up the cards, it's uh, there's a couple of touches for that. It's because uh, you sort of want your, your hand, your fingers, your right hand fingers to, again, it acts as a guide rail right so you want your the, uh you want your thumb and your fingers to be contacting both cards as soon as possible right so as i'm doing this my index ring middle and pinky finger are contacting the front long edge of the deck and as the chain progresses i want my thumb to be contacting the back long edge of the deck right so these fingers ensure that the long edges are square with one another right so if I do this, the long edges aren't going to be, the short edges aren't going to be square, but the long edges are, right? To square up the short edges, what you're going to do is use your index, right? There, there was a reason why your index was here. So your index is over here near the center of the card over here. And that's because it acts as the guide rail for the short edge, right? So when you do this, now the long edges are square. And now what you can do is uh, your thumb can actually move the card around. So I can actually see that the, um, the, the short edge over here is actually not aligned. So what I can do is to actually, I can actually just move my thumb to the left just a bit, which means that through friction, this card will go along and go to the left until it contacts my index finger. So basically my right hand acts as the guide for the um, for the long edges and my index and my thumb act as the guide for the short edges okay so as this change is progressing i'm also adjusting the short edge 
and to make sure that this, this short edge, both short edges are contacting my index, right? And that's how I square up both cards for the, uh, for the Bertram change or the Tebe change one. After you're done executing the change, so over here, and then you do the, the change, right? What Ross Bertram does to show like fairness or to show that his hands are clean after the change is that he actually just, uh, he actually uh, goes into this position, which is he actually doesn't take his entire right hand off of the double just yet. He actually leaves his middle finger on the, uh, on the uh on the top right corner over here his thumb on the bottom right corner and then he moves his index to just be curled in near the center of the card like so right so now he's in this position the very next thing that he's going to do is that he's actually going to apply pressure with his index until this card is being pinched until this lower right corner is being pinched by my index and my thumb right so there's a lot of pressure being applied. But the very next thing that he does is that he actually just removes his in, uh, middle finger, which causes this double to just snap off, right? So he just does, he just moves his index finger and pop, right? So this is what's happening to, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to the double, right? So you apply so much pressure to it that when you release this card, it just snaps into place right so he moves from a from a landscape position again to do the snap as he goes back to a portrait position right and so the reason why he is applying so much pressure to this and then doing the snap is that if he doesn't apply enough pressure to this move and then just does the snap the, the double splits a whole lot so you want to apply a whole lot of pressure and then do the snap which is uh yeah, which is how he does the convincer, right? So that's the entire, um, that's the entire Tebe change, uh, a la Bertram, if you will. Uh, yeah, again, this is, this is trade show magic that he does to sort of show his uh his uh, trep uh capabilities right so he's like you know fairness you know trying to sell himself i guess in, in some sort of way right so that's how that's how he sort of did it i would like to present a couple of uh modernized touches if you will for for the uh tebe change again it's not that the the uh, the original handling for the tebe change was necessarily bad it's just that it's um it's just not suitable for for most use cases nowadays especially with the um with the introduction of uh of um of close-up magic right which was which debuted around like 1929 i think for close-up magic so yeah so uh plenty of people have actually had similar touches to this so i can't really claim as my own but i'll go over my line of thought uh, as I go through the, the change as well, right? The left hand doesn't really change mechanics wise. You're still doing the exact same thing, right? You're still doing the, the alignment and whatnot, but, um, yeah, it's mostly the right hand that has the most changes. So your right fingers besides your thumb actually don't have to contact the front edges, uh, the front edge of the card, right? You only need two edges to match, uh, to, yeah, you only need two edges to match to square up uh, both cards, right? So you notice over here, if I just square up this corner, right? They're practically already squared up, right? So hold up, I'll, I'll do it on the table. So if we just square up these two corners over here, right? This one corner, they're basically already square. I don't need to square up three edges like what Ross Bertram is doing. So essentially, 
these with the middle uh, the index middle ring and pinky finger don't have to be contacting this front edge right so i can just go over here rather than being arced over it right so it can actually be slanted more downwards okay the very next thing is that uh instead of arcing my palm over the cards uh like the most modern handlings of the uh, of the move i'm actually contacting this uh this card with my uh with the uh with the side of my palm right so rather than being arced over it like so i'm actually just setting sitting down on it like so right um so this allows the card to actually be seen fully from the right as opposed to being like arced over which is what ross bertram did right um, so the third change that I did was that you can actually curl in your fingers before the change, right? Specifically the ring and pinky finger. So one thing that I'm not a big fan of, uh, especially regarding Ross Bertram's uh, sort of handling, is that all his fingers are caged around of this card, right? And again, it, it makes sense in context, but for for especially for modern magicians who uh, who do um, who do close up. I think you want to be as uh, as clean and as open as uh, as possible, right? So this is not going to not going to cut it. So rather than being arced over this, again, you're setting down on this, uh, you're you're leaned in on to this card. What you can do is they actually curl in your middle and uh, your your ring finger and your pinky, right? So now you're in this position, right? Which is uh, I wouldn't say this is exactly natural, but it's it's way better than having this because I, I have seen people do this, right? And I will hit you if I see this, right? So this is a lot more natural, uh, or at least relaxed looking, than the uh, than the T Rex hands, right? So I'm just curling in my pinky and my ring finger, and my ring uh, and my middle and my index are still sort of like like extended, right? So it's sort of like this, right? So this is the position that's in, right? So sort of like this, and I actually open my my fingers just a bit, right? Because as long as this this top right corner of the card doesn't exceed the knuckle of my pinky, it won't flash, right? So as long as it's over here, as long as I can match this corner up to this this knuckle, the card won't flash, right? If it starts exceeding it, this edge will flash so i want to make sure that at the very least this corner doesn't exceed this knuckle right so i can curl in this these uh these fingers and we're still good right over here so over here what's really interesting you actually open your hand you actually see the majority of the card right ross bertram can do the same thing but again this is a more modernized version from the right okay so now as you do this uh as you do the change it's the same exact mechanics except that you don't have your your middle ring and uh all your other fingers in front right to square up the cards so again once you match up the corner you just need to push this card in and look, it's already squared up. You don't even need your front fingers to, to square up anything, right? So again, you only need two, two edges. But then you have to ask, what do I do with these fingers now that they're not doing anything? Well, the simplest way to actually just combat this is just to flare out your, your fingers, right? So rather than do this, right? My hand actually just goes into a sort of a sort of flares and strokes the card right so it goes into an upside down u sort of pattern and reconvenes at the bottom right uh bottom right corner yeah so it just goes uh so it's over here right so it just sort of flares around and then reconvenes at the bottom right corner right so you're over here and then just flares around it like so Right, so in in motion, it should look like uh, it should look like this, right? Nope, I'm not squaring my card properly, so it should look like uh, this, right? So you you don't have to. Uh, so this gets rid of the um, the KG look for the uh, for the Bertram change. So rather than having this all 
all uh, all lined up. You only need the thumb, which is hidden by these by this palm, and then your index is also hidden by this palm. So this looks, uh, I would argue, a bit more fair for especially for close up versus uh, versus the uh, the other the other handling, right? But um, yeah, that's um, that's the main changes for the for the change itself, right? So now in this position, right? How you do the uh, convincer or whatever in a, uh, well, there's a flourishy manner that you can do this. Um, so basically you're going to extend your index finger and you're going to contact the upper right, uh, upper right corner of the card over here. And now, uh, so basically now that card is being held by, uh, by the indexes of both, uh, of both hands. The very next thing you're going to do is that your, your thumb is going to go underneath of both cards and it's going to push upwards, right? And as it pushes upwards, your thumb is actually sliding down and then replaces your index as the pivot point, right? And you're going to continue to push this card upwards until it becomes face down. So in this position, right? So over here. Uh, it pushes upwards until your thumb can replace your index. So now you're over here. The very next thing that you're going to do is that your index is actually going to extend and contact, uh, contact the um, contact the short edge from above. So it goes over here, and then it's going to push downwards. So it's going to push downwards, which causes this card to spin, and you're going to continue to spin this card until it's face up. But now that's in this position. It is in a uh, perfect position to be uh, to be just released and go into a dealer's grip, right? So the entire thing just looks like uh, just looks like this, right? So over here, oops, sorry, I'm splitting the card <laughs> over here, and that's that, right? And that's the uh, that's the uh, modernized handling for the um, for the Bertram change. So just before I go, I want to give an additional idea. So what if your right hand is the one that stays still and your left hand is the one that moves, right? Because right now, uh, if you're familiar with the Bertram change, it's always the right hand that moves, right? But what if moving your left hand can accomplish the same thing mechanically as what moving your right hand does, right? So you'll notice that when I move, the Bertram, so when I do the Bertram change, the right hand has to move, right? But, uh, well, uh, this card, well, more specifically, it's this card that has to move, right? Uh, my right hand actually doesn't need to do anything. So when I move my left hand to the left and I leave my thumb there, what can happen is that the same mechanics occur right i don't even need to move my right hand but instead i can just go move my left hand and then i could just square up the cards as per usual so uh yeah what if you're what if you're preparing to do the change right and then you're like uh and then you move your left hand right you gesture with your left hand so you have your hand over here and then you're preparing to do the change and then you're like are you sure this isn't your card and then as you move your, your left hand to gesture, that's when you do this change. So um, yeah, it's going to be non-visual in a way, but it is an interesting way to approach uh, this sort of change because again, we as magicians are so used to seeing the Bertram change in this one context, right? So the moment you see someone go straight into this, you're like, ah, oh, I already know what, what it is, right? But what if you suddenly break that pattern and you're like, ah, oh, yeah, everything's fair, and then you know the cards changed. So I think that's just a an interesting way to approach this change. Again, it's just it's just an additional idea, but 
you know, if uh, if it suits your palate and if there's something that you can and that you want to do with this sort of idea, you know, just uh, yeah, just feel free to use it. I guess it's it's probably not even my own. I'm I'm sure like so many more more magicians have thought of this specific idea, but you know, yeah, that's just a uh, an additional idea for you. So uh, if you're interested in uh, reading up on the uh, Bertram on sleight of hand, there's a couple of things that um, that. Uh, well, not the Bertram Slav uh, on the Tebe change or the Bertram change. So Bertram Slav hand is unfortunately full, sold out. A library doesn't even have it as a, a PDF, unfortunately. So you know it's it's generally just gone. You have to buy it from a secondhand source. Um, a new angle by Ryan Plunkett and Michael Feldman. Uh, Nancy Colwell actually has a um, not necessarily a. Um, a Tebe change, but she uses it for a uh, for a different sort of purpose, which is sort of interesting. So you should go ahead and pick up that book. There's also talk about tricks by Joshua J. Um, Andy Gladwin has a specific approach for the uh, Tebe change uh, in that book, so you go ahead and check that out. Uh, Project S by Simon Black. Uh, again, there's a uh, Bertram change. He calls it the. Uh, was it like the Bertram Plus or something again? Uh, something along those lines. Uh, the Chris Orbit Brown at the Table Live lecture. Uh, he talks about the uh, the Bertram change, I guess, or sort of an extension to it. But um, yeah, a lot of people have had similar ideas with it, so you know that's uh, that's that. But yeah, that concludes the um, the the uh, the live stream, I guess. So it's uh it's definitely a fun fun change. I typically don't do color changes uh, during like real life performances because that's not the sort of thing that I thrive for. Again, I I want to have like more emotional, more Spanish style magic. But you know, for social media, it's it's kind of cool, right? Um, but yeah, that's uh, this is the first of the classic color changes that I'm going to cover on my live stream lectures, right? Um, uh, surprisingly, this uh, this video spanned a lot longer than I thought it would be. Uh, but yeah, that's that's fine, right? Uh, funnily enough, this is the shortest of my of my uh, work on class color changes, the Ernais and the Cardini. I'm going to have uh, quite a bit to say about it. So uh, yeah, but besides that, uh, stay healthy, stay safe. And see you guys on the next one.